He called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He ordered them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. He said to them, wherever you enter a house, stay there until you leave the place. If any place will not welcome you and they refuse to hear you as you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that all should repent. And they cast out many demons and anointed uh, with oil many who were sick and cured them. The apostles gathered around Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. And he said to them, come away to a deserted place all by yourselves and rest for a while. For many were coming and going and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in a boat to a deserted place by themselves. In his book, Soul Keeping, Taking Care of the Most Important Part of You, John Ortberg likens the soul to a flowing, life-giving stream that, if not tended to, if not taken care of, will clog with decaying debris. And he says, we are the keepers of our soul, and we are responsible to take care of our souls, not just for our own sake. The condition of our souls will affect the people around us, just as when our bodies are sick can infect others uh, who get too close. Now, he, Ortberg wrote this book prior to COVID, so he had no idea uh, that that would be a, a very true statement, uh, a very germane statement for our time. But in the house, uh, uh, but, but one day, uh, Jesus called the twelve and commissioned them to, to go out in pairs to do ministry without the security of traveling in the group of twelve or thirteen, uh, and without Jesus with them to guide them and to, to keep them out of trouble. In the hostile environment of the religious leaders and also uh, the oppressive Roman government, uh, I imagine that this was high-stress duty. Uh, any wrong move or word, they, they could be accused and arrested as insurrectionists uh, or bring shame on the cause of Christ. They took no provisions. Uh, they were very vulnerable and dependent on the kindness and charity of the very people that they were calling to repentance. No bread, no bag, no money, uh, no change of clothing. But Jesus did equip them with the, uh, with, uh, with the authority over unclean spirits. And it seems their efforts, two by two, without the group, without Jesus, was very successful. Mark says they cast out many demons and they cured many who were sick. But Mark interrupts the story um, right after our verse 13 uh, about Jesus sending the twelve out without him and delays the ending of the story to tell us about the arrest and the eventual beheading of John the Baptist at the hands of King Herod. Now, at first glance, um, I'm thinking, well, that's an odd place to insert the story uh, about John the Baptist, arrest and death. Seems, seems a little bit out of place to plop that story down right in the middle of Jesus sending his disciples out two by two to do ministry. Uh, and we have to believe that it does have some significance to the context. If it didn't, if it didn't have some significance, Mark could have placed the, Bab the John the Baptist story anywhere else. I think it is significant because some of the twelve, as you recall, were followers of John the Baptist before they became disciples of Jesus. Uh, and mourning the loss of their beloved friend and former chief teacher was an added emotional and spiritual drain on their lives. Additionally, the death of John the Baptist would have been perceived by, by the disciples anyway as a setback or a threat to, to, to their ministry and to Jesus' ministry. So the twelve, the apostles, as Mark is already calling them, came back from the mission uh, Jesus had dispatched them on, a mission filled with opposition and, and danger, 
They were drained and exhausted, mourning the loss of John the Baptist. Fearful King Herod uh, would be coming to arrest him next. And Mark says there were many, uh, so many demands uh, for their attention. Many poor people, many suffering people were coming to them for help to the point that they didn't even have time to eat. We can see why Jesus said, fellows, uh, come away, come away with me to a deserted place all by ourselves uh, so that we can, we can rest for a while. Now, Jesus knew that they were weary and they needed to rest their minds and their body and their souls. And stealing off uh, uh, to a deserted place by himself uh, was already a habit uh, of Jesus. After Jesus ministered to the suffering masses, he took time uh, and left them and to, to find a deserted place to spend time in prayer with his Father. And he knew the exhausted apostles, he knew his exhausted twelve uh, needed to rest their souls. Let's get away to a deserted place, uh, uh, just, uh, just us, no one else, just us, uh, and rest for a while. And Mark says they went away to a deserted place by themselves. And by the way, they went, uh, uh, they, they went on a boat to get there. Now, I've never considered that getting on a boat to get to the deserted place uh, by themselves may have, uh, may have been on purpose and may have added value to this therapeutic exercise. What better place to be than on the water to have our souls restored? As it turns out, the trip on the boat was the only time together they enjoyed. The crowds evidently knew uh, which deserted place they were going to and they, uh, they were headed to, and they were waiting for Jesus and the disciples and the twelve when they stepped off the boat. But Jesus knew they needed rest even when the poor and needy throngs were demanding their attention. I wonder what makes us think that the things that demand our attention are so vitally important that we can't pause for just a few hours and rest our, our weary souls. And on the seventh day, God finished the work that He had done, and He rested on the seventh day from all of the work that He had done. So God blessed the seventh day, seventh day and, and hallowed it, uh, because on it God rested from all of the work that He had done in creation. Ortberg reminds us that in decades past, Sunday... Sunday was a day of rest for, for commerce, for sports, for civic activity. Uh, and one didn't have any choice but to rest because there wasn't anything else to do. Everything was closed except for church and maybe the police and fire station. Everything else was closed. You couldn't do anything. And when I was growing up, full of energy, uh, probably full of other things too, but full of energy, I, I, I chafed under the rules of my church that prohibited anything on Sunday that was fun. If it was fun, you couldn't do it on Sunday. But in the crazed bustle of our world today, I appreciate, I appreciate a lazy Sunday afternoon. And we better understand now why, why God, the Creator, would bless the Sabbath day. Our souls get weary and they need rest. And we have read this story that Ortberg uses from other sources. But in one of her devotional books, Letty Kalman uh, writes about a traveler visiting Africa who hired a group of carriers and guides from a local tribe. And she wanted to make the best of her time and move as fast as possible. Uh, and she was pleased with the progress uh, of the miles that they had covered on the first day. On the second day, however, all of the carriers and the guides that she had hired from, uh, from a local tribe remained seated and wouldn't move. They refused to get up and travel. Frustrated, she asked the leader uh, of her hired hands uh, why they wouldn't continue their journey. And he told her that the first day they had traveled too far and too fast. And now they were waiting for their souls to catch up with their bodies. And Kalman reflects, this whirling, rushing life which so many of us live does for us what that first day of traveling did for those tribesmen. The difference, however, they knew what they needed to restore life's balance. And too often, we don't. 
in the context of fatigue, Ortberg says there's a kind of fatigue that attacks the body. And when we stay up too late and, and get up too early, when we try to fuel ourselves uh, for the day with a cup of coffee and a donut in the morning and a Red Bull in the afternoon, when we refuse to take time to exercise, exercise and eat foods that clog our brains and our arteries, there's a kind of fatigue that attacks our minds. When we're bombarded with information, when multiple screens are clamoring for our attention, when we carry around mental lists of errands not yet done, bills not yet paid, and emails not yet replied to, there's a kind of fatigue that attacks our will. We have so many decisions to make, makes it hard to decide anything. Nortberg says these categories of fatigue are difficult enough in and of themselves, but they, but they combine to, to make us feel separated from God and separated from ourselves and distanced, uh, distanced from, from what we love most about life and creation. And if we don't care for our soul, the soul becomes fatigued. And God created the rest for the fatigued soul. God also created our souls and designed them to need God and to search for God and our souls uh, 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 and for our souls to be truly at rest they need to be with God as I said as I said last week and I've said it before uh, what August, uh, quoting Augustine you have made us for yourself O God and our hearts and our, our souls are restless until they find rest in you for our souls to be truly at rest, they need to be with God. Jesus knew the apostles, the disciples, the twelve, needed to get away. They were exhausted. They were drained. They were, they were grieving over the loss. They needed to get away to a deserted place all by themselves to restore, to rest their weary souls. But I think Jesus, just like his father, wanted this time also uh, to be with his closest friends. I think he wanted that also. And Ortberg reminds us uh, one of the most intriguing phrases in the Bible is where Adam and Eve heard the sound of the Lord as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Now, God is spirit, Ortberg reminds us, which means he doesn't have a body, doesn't have feet to trample on grass. So what does it mean, uh, or, or what does it sound like when, when God walks, or what, when God goes for a walk? The point is, uh, the point of this remarkable phrase is uh, uh, that walking is something you do with somebody that you care about, a friend with a friend, a child with a parent, uh, uh, two people who are in love going for a walk. It's not really about the walk, it's about being with someone. And this God, this God of the Bible is a God who wants to be with. Our souls were made to walk with God, but the man and the woman in the garden, Adam and Eve, they were deliberately hiding for, uh, for, from God because of their sin. Yet God would not be denied, and he went after them. In fact, the whole narrative of the Bible, Ortberg reminds us, uh, the whole narrative of the Bible is all about God going after us, God seeking us, relentlessly pursuing us. And as Adam and Eve hid in the garden, God called out, Where are you? Adam and Eve, where are you? Where are you? He knew exactly where they were. He was God. What God was really asking, where are you in relation to me? Where are you in relation to me? And Ortberg concludes, all God has ever wanted is to be with you and to be with me. Amen.